Daughter of Invention, from How the Garcia Girls Lost Their Accents, by Julia Alvarez. Her daughters would seek her out at night when she seemed to have a moment to talk to them. They were having trouble at school or they wanted her to persuade their father to give them permission to go into the city or to a shopping mall or a movie. In broad daylight, mommy. Laura would wave them out of her room. The problem with you girls. The problem boiled down to the fact that they wanted to become Americans and their father and their mother too at first would have none of it. You girls are driving me crazy, she threatened if they kept nagging. When I end up in Bellevue, you'll be safely sorry. She spoke in English when she argued with them, and her English was a mi mis mishmash of mixed up idioms and sayings that showed she was green behind the ears, as she called it. If her husband insisted she speak Spanish to the girls so they wouldn't forget their native tongue, she'd snap. When in Rome, do enter the Romans. Yo-Yo, the big mouth, had become the spokesman for her sisters and she stood her ground in that bedroom. We're not going to that school anymore, mommy. You have to. Her eyes would widen with worry. In this country, it is against the law not to go to school. You wanna get us thrown out? You wanna get us killed? Those kids were throwing stones today. Sticks on stones don't break bones, she chanted. Yo-Yo could tell though, by the look on her face, it was as if one of those stones the kids had aimed at her daughters had hit her, but she always pretended they were at fault. What did you do to provoke them? Takes two to tangle, you know. Thanks a lot, Mom. Yo-Yo stormed out of the room and into her own room. Her daughters never called her Mom, except when they wanted her to feel how much that she had failed them in this country. She was a good enough Mommy, fussing and scolding and giving advice, but a terrible girlfriend parent, a real failure of a mom. Back she went to her pencil and pad, scribbling and tisking and tearing off sheets, finally giving up and taking up her New York Times. Some nights though, she got a good idea. She rushed into Yo-Yo's room, a flushed look on her face, her tablet of paper in her hand, a cursory knock on the door she'd just thrown open. Do I have something to show to you, Kukita? This was Yo-Yo's time to herself after she finished her homework while her sisters were still downstairs watching TV in the basement. Hunched over her small desk, the overhead light turned off, her desk lamp poignantly lighting only her paper, the rest of the room in warm, soft, uncreated darkness. She wrote her secret poems in her new language. You're gonna ruin your eyes, Laura began, snapping on the overhead, bright overhead light, scaring off whatever shy passion Yo-Yo with the blue thread of her writing, had just begun coaxing out of a labyrinth of feelings. Oh, mommy, Yo-Yo cried out, her eyes blinking up at her mother. I'm writing, ay Kukita. This was her communal pet name for whoever was in her favor. Kukita, when I make a million, buy you your very own typewriter. Yo-Yo had been nagging her mother for one, just like the one her father had bought to do his order forms at home. Gravy on the turkey was what she called it when someone was buttering her up. She buttered and poured. I'll hire you your very own typist. Down she plopped on the bed and held out her pad. Take a guess, Kukita. Yo-Yo studied the rough sketch a moment. Soap sprayed from the nozzle head of a shower when you turn the knob a certain way. Instant coffee with a creamer already mixed in. Time-released water capsules for your potted plants when you were away. A keychain with a timer that would go off when your parking meter was about to expire. The ticking would help you find your keys easily if you mislaid them. The famous one, famous only in hindsight, was the stick person dragging a square by a rope. A suitcase with wheels? Oh, of course, Yo-Yo said, humoring her. What every household needs, a shower like a car wash. Keys ticking like a bomb, luggage on a leash. By now, it had become something of a family joke. Their own Thomas Edison mommy, their Benjamin Franklin mom. Her face fell. Come on now, use your head. One more guess and she'd show Yo-Yo, pointing with her pencil to the different highlights on this incredible new wonder. Remember the time we took the car to Bear Mountain and we realized 
that we for, for, had forgotten to pack an opener with our picnic? Her daughters kept correcting her, but she insisted this was how it should be said. When we were ready to eat, we didn't have any way to open the refreshment cans. This was before flip top lids, when she claimed, which she claimed had crossed her mind. You know what this is now? Yo-Yo shook her head. It's a car bumper, but see, this part is a removable can opener. So simple yet so necessary, eh? Yeah, mommy, you should patent it. Yo-Yo shrugged as her mother tore off the scratch paper and folded it carefully, corner to corner, as if she was going to save it. But then she tossed it into the waste back basket on her way out of the room and gave a little laugh like a disclaimer. It's, one, it's half of one or two dozen of another. None of her daughters was very encouraging. They resented her spending time on those dumb inventions. Here they were trying to fit in in America, among Americans. They needed help figuring out who they were, why the Irish kids, whose grandparents had been called Mix, were calling them Spicks. Why had they come to this country in the first place? Important, crucial, final things. And here was their mother, who didn't have a second to help them puzzle any of this out, inventing gadgets to make life easier for the American moms. Sometimes Yo-Yo challenged her. Why, Mommy? Why do it? You're never going to make money. The Americans have already thought of everything. You know that. Maybe not. Maybe, just maybe, there's something they've missed that's important. With patience and calm, even a burrow can climb a palm. This last one was one of her many Dominican sayings that she had imported into her scrambled English. But what's the point? Yo-Yo persisted. Point, point. Why does everything need a point? Why do you write poems? Yo-Yo had to admit it was her mother who had the point there. Still, in the hierarchy of things, a poem seemed much more important than a, a potty that played music when a toilet training toddler went in its bowl. They talked about it among themselves, the four girls, as they often did now, about the many puzzling things in this new country. Better she reinvents the wheel than be on our cases all the time, the oldest Carla observed. In the close quarters of an American nuclear family, their mother's prodigious energy was becoming a real drain on their self-determination. Let her have a project. What harm could she do? And besides, she noted she needed that an acknowledgement. It had come to her automatically in the old country from being a de la Torre. Garcia de la Torre, Laura would enunciate carefully, giving her maiden as well as married name when they first arrived but the blank smiles had never heard of her name. She would show them. She would prove to these Americans what a smart woman could do with a pencil and a pad. She had a near miss once. Every night, she liked to read the New York Times in bed before turning off her light to see what the Americans were up to. One night, she let out a yelp to wake her husband beside her. He sat bolt upright, reaching for his glasses, which in his haste were knocked across the room. Que pasa? Que pasa? What's wrong? There was terror in his voice, the same fear she had heard in the Dominican Republic before they left. They had been watched there. He was followed. They could not talk, of course, though they had whispered to each other in fear at night in the dark bed. Now in America, he was safe, a success even. His centro de medicina in the Bronx was thronged with the sick and the homesick, yearning to go home again. But in dreams, he went back to those awful days and long nights, and his wife's screams confirmed his every secret fear. They had not gone away after all. The SIM had come for them at last. Hi, Kuko, remember how I showed you that suitcase with the little wheels so that we would not have to carry those heavier bags when we traveled? Somebody stole my idea and made a million. She shook the paper in his face. See, see, this man was no bobo. He didn't put all his pokers on a back burner. I keep telling you, one of these days my ship would pass me by in the night. She wagged her finger at her husband and daughters, laughing all the while, one of those eerie laughs crazy people in movies laugh. The four girls had congregated in her room. They eyed their mother and then each other. Perhaps they were all thinking the same thing. 
Wouldn't it be weird and sad if mommy did end up in Bellevue? Yeah, yeah. She waved them out of her room at last. There's no use trying to drink spilt milk, that's for sure. It was the suitcase rollers that finally stopped Laura's hand. She had weather veined a minor brainstorm. And yet, this plagiarist had gotten all the credit and all the money. What use was it trying to compete with the Americans? They would always have a head start. It was their country, after all. Best stick close to home. She cast her sights about, and her daughter ducked, and found her husband's office in need. Several days a week, dressed professionally in a white smock with a little name tag pinned on the label, lapel, a shopping bag full of cleaning materials and rags, she rode with her husband in his car to the Bronx. On the way, she organized the glove compartment or took off the address stickers from the magazines for the waiting room, because she had read somewhere how by means of these stickers, drug addicts' patients found out where doctors lived and burglarized their homes looking for syringes. At night, she did the books, filling in columns with how much money they had made that day. Who had time to be inventing silly things? She did take up her pencil and pad one last time, however, but it was to help one of her daughters out. In ninth grade, Yo-Yo was chosen by her English teacher, Sister Mary Joseph, to deliver the teacher's day address at the school assembly. Back in the Dominican Republic growing up, Yo-Yo had been a terrible student. No one could ever get her to sit down to a book, but in New York, she needed to settle somewhere. And since the natives were unfriendly and the country inhospitable, she took root in the language. By high school, the nuns were reading her stories and compositions out loud in English class. But the specter of delivering, delivering a speech, brown-nosing the teachers, jammed her imagination. At first, she didn't want to, and then she couldn't seem to write that speech. She should have thought of it as a great honor, as her father called it, but she was mortified. She still had a slight accent, and she didn't like to speak in publish, public subjecting herself to her classmates' ridicule. It also took no great figuring out to see that to deliver a eulogy for a convent full of crazy, old, overweight nuns was no way to endear herself to her peers. But she didn't know how to get out of it. Night after night, she sat at her desk, hoping to polish off some quick, noncommittal little speech, but she couldn't get anything down. The weekend before the assembly, Monday morning, Yo-Yo went into a panic. Her mother would just have to call in tomorrow and say Yo-Yo was in the hospital in a coma. Laura tried to calm her down. Just remember how Mr. Lincoln couldn't think of anything to say at Gettysburg. And then, bang, war score and once upon a time ago, she began reciting. Something is going to come if you just relax. You'll see, like the Americans say, necessity is the daughter of invention. I'll help you. That weekend, her mother turned all her energy towards helping Yo-Yo write her speech. Please, mommy, just leave me alone, please. Yo-Yo pleaded with her. But Yo-Yo would get rid of the goose, only to have to contend with the gander. Her father kept poking in his head to her door just to see if Yo-Yo had fulfilled your obligations, a phrase he'd used when the girls were younger and he'd checked to see whether they had gone to the bathroom for a car trip. Several times that weekend around the supper table, he recited his own high school valedictorian speech. He gave Yo-Yo pointers on delivery, notes on the great orders and their tricks. Humbleness and praise and falling silent with great emotion were her, his favorites. Laura sat across the table, the only one who seemed to be listening to him. Yo-Yo and her sisters were forgetting a lot of their Spanish, and her, their father's formal, florid diction was hard to understand. But Laura smiled softly to herself and turned the lazy Susan at the center of the table around and around as if it were the prime mover, the first gear of her attention. That Sunday evening, Yo-Yo was reading some poetry to get herself inspired. Whitman's poems in an old book with an engraved cover her father had picked up in a thrift shop next to his office. I celebrate myself and sing myself. He most honors my style who learns under it to destroy the teacher. The poet's words shocked and thrilled her. She'd gotten used to the nuns, a literature of appropriate sentiments, 
almost with a message, expurgated texts. But here was a flesh and blood man belching and laughing and sweating in poems. Who touches this book touches a man. That night, at last, she sat, sat down and started to write, recklessly, three, five pages, looking up once, only to see her father passing by the hall on tiptoe. When Yo-Yo was done, she read over her words, and her eyes filled. She finally sounded like herself in English. As soon as she'd finished the first draft, she called her mother to her room. Laura listened attentively while Yo-Yo read her speech out loud. And in the end, her eyes were glistening too. Her face was soft and warm and proud. I, Yo-Yo, you're going to be the one to bring our name into the headlights of this country. That is a beautiful, beautiful speech. I want for your father to hear it before he goes to speech, or want before he goes to sleep. Then I'll type it for you, all right? Down the hall they went, mother and daughter, faces flushed with accomplishment, into the master bedroom where Carlos was plop, propped up on his pillows, still awake, reading the Dominican papers, already days old. Now that the dictatorship had been toppled, he had become interested in the country's fate again. The interim government was going to hold the first three first free elections in 30 years. History was in the making. Freedom and hope were in the air again. There was still some question in his mind whether or not he might move his family back. But Laura had gotten used to the life here. She didn't want to go back to the old country where, de la torre or not, she was only a wife and a mother, and a failed one at that since she had never been provided, she had never provided the required son. Better an independent nobody than a high-class house slave. She did not come straight out and disagree with her husband's plans. Instead, she fussed with him about reading the papers in bed, soiling their sheets with those poorly printed foreign tabloids. The Times is not that bad, she'd claim if her husband tried to humor her by saying they shared the same dirty habit. The minute Carlos saw his wife and daughter filing in, he put his paper down, and his face brightened as if at long last his wife had delivered a son, and that was the news she was bringing him. His teeth were already grinning from the glass of water next to his bedside lamp, so he lisped when he said, A speech, a speech! It is so beautiful, Cuco, Laura coached him, turning the sound on his TV off. She sat down at the foot of the bed, Yo-Yo stood for both of them, blocking their view of the soldiers and helicopters landing amid silence gun reports and explosions. A few weeks ago, it had been on the shores of the Dominican Republic. Now it was the jungles of Southeast Asia they were saving. Her mother gave the nod to begin reading. Yo-Yo didn't need much encouragement. She put her nose to the fire, as her mother would have said, and read from start to finish without looking up. When she concluded, she was a little embarrassed at the pride she took in her own words. She pretended to quibble with a phrase or two, then looked questioningly to her mother. Laura's face was radiant. Yo-Yo turned to share her pride with her father. The expression on his face shocked both mother and daughter. Carlos's toothless mouth had collapsed into a dark zero. His eyes bored into Yo-Yo, then shifted to Laura, in barely audible Spanish, as if secret microphones or informers were all about, he whispered to his wife, you will permit her to read that? You will permit her to read that? Laura's eyebrows shot up, her mouth fell open. In the old country, any whisper of a challenge to authority could bring the secret police in their black VWs. But this was America. People could say what they thought, what is wrong with her speech? Laura questioned him. What is wrong with her speech? Carlos wagged his head at her. His anger was always more frightening in his broken English. As if he had mutilated the language in his fury. And now there was nothing to stand between them and his raw, dumb anger. What is wrong? I will tell you what is wrong. It show no gratitude. It is boastful. I celebrate myself? The best student learns to destroy the teacher? He mocked Yo-Yo's plagiarized words. 
That is insubordinate. It is improper. It is disrespecting of her teachers. In his anger, he'd forgotten his fear of lurking spies. Each word he voiced was a decibel higher than the last outrage. Finally, he shouted at Yo-Yo. As your father, I forbid you to make that a speech. Laura leapt to her feet, a sign that she was about to deliver her own speech. She was a small woman, and she spoke all her pronouncements standing up, either for more projection or as a carryover from her girlhood in convent schools where one asked for and literally took the floor in order to speak. She began by Yo-Yo's side, shoulder to shoulder. They looked down at Carlos. That is no tone of voice, she began. But now, Carlos was truly furious. It was bad enough that his daughter was rebelling, but here was his own wife joining forces with her. Soon he would be surrounded by a houseful of independent American women. He too leapt from the bed, throwing off his covers. The Spanish newspapers flew across the room. He snatched the speech out of Yo-Yo's hands, held it before the girl's wide eyes, a vengeful, mad look in his own, and then once Twice, three, four, countless times, he tore the speech into threads. Are you crazy? Laura lunged at him. Have you gone mad? That is her speech for tomorrow you have torn up. Have you gone mad? He shook her away. You were going to let her read that, that insult to her teachers? Insult to her teachers? Laura's face had crumpled up like a piece of paper. On it was written a love note to her husband an unhappy, haunted man. This is America, Poppy, America. You are not in a savage country anymore. Meanwhile, Yo-Yo was on her knees, weeping wildly, collecting all the little pieces of her speech, hoping that she could put it back together before the assembly tomorrow morning. But not even a sibyl could have made sense of those tiny scraps of paper. All hope was lost. He broke it. He broke it. Yo-Yo moaned as she picked up a handful of pieces. Probably, if she had thought a moment about it, she would not have done what she did next. She would have realized her father had lost brothers and friends to the dictator Trujillo. For the rest of his life, he would be haunted by blood in the streets and late-night disappearances. Even after all these years, he cringed if a black Volkswagen passed him in the street. He feared anyone in uniform a meter maid giving out parking tickets, a museum guard approaching to tell him not to get too close to his favorite Goya. On her knees, Yo-Yo thought about the worst thing she could say to her father. She gathered a handful of scraps, stood up, and hurled them in his face. In a low, ugly whisper, she pronounced Trujillo's hatred nickname. Chapitza! You're just another Chapitza! It took Yo-Yo's father only a moment to register the loathsome nickname before he came after her. Down the halls they raced, but Yo-Yo was quicker than he was and made a new door room just in time to lock the door as her father threw his weight against it. He called down the curses on her head, ordered her on his authority as her father to open that door. He throttled that doorknob, but all to no avail. Her mother's love of gadgets saved Yo-Yo's hide that night. Laura had hired a locksmith to install good locks on all the bedroom doors after the house had been broken into while they were, while they were away. Now, if burglar, burglars broke in and the family were at home, there would be a second round of locks for the thieves to contend with. Lolo, she said, trying to calm him down. Don't you ruin my new locks. Finally, he did calm down, his anger spent. Yo-Yo heard their footsteps retreating down the hall. The door clicked shut. Then, muffled voices. Her mother's rising in anger and persuasion. Her father's deeper murmurs of explanation and self-defense. The house fell silent a moment. Before Yo-Yo heard, far off, gun blasts and explosions, the serious, self-important voices of newscasters reporting the TV war. A little while later, there was a quiet knock at Yo-Yo's door, followed by a tentative attempt at the door knob. Kukita, her mother whispered. Open up, Kukita. Go away, Yo-Yo wailed. 
but they both knew she was glad her mother was there and needed only a moment's protest to save face. Together, they concocted a speech, two pages, brief pages of stale compliments and the polite com commonplaces on teachers, a speech wrought by necessity and without much invention by mother and daughter late into the night on one of the pads of paper Laura had once used for her own inventions. After it was drafted, Laura typed it up while Yo-Yo stood by, correcting her mother's misnomers and missayings. Yo-Yo came home the next day with a success story of the assembly. The nuns had been flattered. The audience had stood up and given our devoted teachers a standing ovation, what Laura had suggested they do at the end of the speech. She clapped her hands together as Yo-Yo recreated the moment. I stole that from your father's speech, remember? Remember how he put that in at the end? She quoted him in Spanish, then translated for Yo-Yo into English. That, yet, that night, Yo-Yo watched him from the upstairs hall window where she'd retreated the moment she heard his car pull up in front of the house. Slowly, her father came up the door, driveway, a grim expression on his face as he grappled with a huge, heavy cardboard box. At the front door, he set the package down carefully and patted all his pockets for his house keys. If only he'd had Laura's ticking keychain. Yo-Yo heard the snapping open of locks downstairs. She listened as he struggled to maneuver the box through the narrow doorway. He called her name several times, but she didn't answer him. My daughter, your father, he'd love you very much, he explained from the bottom of the stairs. He just wants to protect you. Finally, her mother came up and pleaded with Yo-Yo to go down and reconcile with him. Your father did not mean harm. You must pardon him. Always it is better to let bygones be forgotten, no? Downstairs, Yo-Yo found her father setting up a brand new electric typewriter on the kitchen table. It was even better than her mother's. He had outdone himself with all the extra features, a plastic carrying case with Yo-Yo's initials declared below the handle, a brace to lift the paper upright while she typed, and a race cartridge, an automatic margin tab, a plastic hood like a toaster cover to keep the dust away. Not even her mother would have invented, invented such a machine. But Laura's inventing days were over, just as yo-yos were starting up with her school-wide success. Rather than the rolling suitcase everyone else in the family remembers, yo-yo thinks of the speech her mother wrote as her last invention. It was as if, after that, her mother had passed on to yo-yo her pencil and pad and said, Okay, Kukita, here's the buck. You give it a shot.